Pray with me together. Our God, we pray that even now you would fill us and visit us by your spirit. You know what we need, and you have told us that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we pray, O Lord, that you would speak to us for our very life's sake and for our soul's sake. We pray as we, your people, pray, and with the help and supply of the Holy Spirit, you might help us now so that Christ would be known and the gospel would be advanced, and also that our progress in the faith and joy might increase even now. Come do this and more, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you know the game, Would You Rather? Right? You kids have definitely played Would You Rather. You know, would you rather be a famous actor or a famous musician? Would you rather have superhuman strength or the ability to fly? Would you rather be tackled by Ray Lewis or punched by Bruce Lee? That last one, by the way, is one that Binu came up with at one of our first dinners at his house. So you can imagine the kind of deep conversation that drew us into friendship with Binu. But that's, that's sort of would you rather. Well, in our passage today, it's like this early Christian teacher named Paul has a would you rather question that he's having the hardest time answering. He's got this question that he's really stumbling to try and pick between. And here's the question that has stumped Paul. You ready? Paul, would you rather live or die? And Paul's response to that is, oh, that's a hard one. That's really tough. You see, Paul is weighing between these two options. And did you hear how he described these two choices? He describes it as almost if he had a choice, and of course he doesn't. But if he did, he says in verse 22, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. Did you catch that? Between living or dying, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between these two options. There's one preacher named Akshay Rajkumar. He said, it's almost like someone who sounds like they're debating between should I vacation in Tahiti or Bora Bora this year? And you go, oh, that's a really hard choice. Like a game show where behind door number one is a brand new car and behind door number two is a brand new car. These are two really great options. And that's the way Paul sees life and death. Should I continue living or should I die? Oh, I am hard-pressed between the two. I cannot tell which I should choose because both seem for Paul like really great options. Because you see, Paul is someone who has a reason to live and yet is ready to die. Both seem like really great options for Paul because Paul has a reason to live and yet is ready to die. Now, do we even need to state the obvious? The obvious being that this is not how most people and most of us think about death. In fact, one of the ways that we think about death is precisely that we don't. We don't want to think about death. We can talk about anything and everything except for death. And yet, oddly enough, death is batting a thousand. Death comes for us all. And yet for a lot of us, until we face it through some circumstance in life, or view our own mortality, death seems like an intellectual reality, something we rationally know, but it's not really applicable to us. I mean, it's an amazing thing. I was reading, someone said, you know, despite the increased number of wars, despite the more famines and natural disasters, it has not increased the death toll by even one. Because death always remains a thousand percent. Death comes for us all, whether we be in health or in famine or in war or in gladness, in the most comfortable places, in the worst of places. Death comes for everyone. It always bats a thousand. And yet we have this way of being able to push that down or avoid it away or not make ourselves think about the reality that we, that you, are going to die. That reality, even when you visit a funeral, feels like a sorry thing for him or her or them or they, but not something that's present as a reality for you. We don't like to think about death. And if we do stop to think about it, if we stare it in its face, the other response is that we're scared to death of death. We're scared of it. And, and of course, understandably so, reasonably so, because death is horrible and horrific, and horrifying. It is cruel, and ugly, and frightening. 
One writer said it this way, death is this great interrupter that rips us away from people we love and rips people we love away from us. It's hideous and cruel and frightening, and we are scared to death about death. I, I was reading this interview with the late Steve Jobs, the great founder of Apple. And Steve Jobs, as he was viewing his own death in light of his cancer some years back, he began to process sort of what was waiting for him in death and what was on the other side of death. And in this one interview, he began to say, you know, I now think a little bit more about God. And he said he was open to the possibility of God because, after all, he sort of wished it were true. He thought to himself, he hopes that there's more beyond this life and that it's not just that all that you've accumulated and all the wisdom just suddenly goes away. But then he paused in this interview and he opened himself to the possibility that there's nothing beyond this. And this is what he said. He said, quote, yeah, but sometimes I think it's like an on-off switch. Click and you're gone. And then he paused again and he said this. And that's why I don't put on-off switches on Apple devices. Isn't that fascinating? That the Apple device that you have in your pocket or at your home, its very design is shaped by a thought of death. That the thought of being just at the end of the day a machine that gets clicked on or clicked off was so horrific to Steve Jobs, he wouldn't allow such a switch on any Apple device. That's how deeply we think of what it means to be alive or dead or the prospect of death. You can understand why we would want to avoid this or if we actually think about it, would be afraid of it or might try our best to delay it or even defeat it. But whatever our response to this might be, here is a early believer in Jesus Christ named Paul who is dealing with death differently. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is not avoiding it. He's staring it in the face, and genuinely, friends, he doesn't seem to flinch. Genuinely, friends, as you read this, he truly doesn't seem afraid. Not like in some kind of bravado where he can pen a few good words that sound really nice. To his core, he doesn't feel afraid of death. He's staring at it, and he doesn't flinch. He's not phased. He's not afraid. But oddly enough, he seems strangely confident in the face of death. Paul saw both doors, door one and door two, and saw them favorably, saw them as two options, like a holiday in Tahiti or Bora Bora, like both being great choices. And the question for us is, why and how? And how might we hear what he says that we might think the same as well? Because what you'll see in this passage is that Paul had a reason to live and yet was ready to die. Those are the two doors he's looking at. Let's consider the first together, the door of death. Now, consider this with me. You should know the reason that Paul is thinking about death isn't because he's just morbid or because he's suicidal in some kind of way. He's in, he's in this hard spot, and so he's thinking of some horrible thing. It's, it's not that at all. You see, central to Paul's understanding and beliefs was that he's not God. God is the author of life. He didn't give himself life, and he can't take his life away. God determines who lives and who dies, and when you live and when you die. And so it's not that he's suicidal, and it's not that he's morbid. It's actually quite practical. The reason Paul is thinking about death is if you were here, you heard in the book of Philippians, he's in prison. And sitting in prison, it's the real possibility of being executed hangs over Paul's head. There's a real possibility he's going to be put to death. And so as Paul looks down the future at what's coming... He sees there's really only two ways he's getting out of prison. Either he's going to be released and he can go on living for Jesus, or he's going to be found guilty and put to death. Those are the two doors in front of him. One or the other, he is certainly going to walk through, and that's the only way out of prison. And so while Paul is not sure which door God is going to have him walk through, there are some things that Paul is absolutely sure of that makes him ready to die. You see, he's not sure which door God's going to have him go through, life or death, but he is sure that even if he should go through the door of death, there are two things in particular he is absolutely sure of that makes him ready to die. You see, what Paul is sure of is sure of what and who waits for him beyond death. 
Paul is sure of what and who waits for him beyond death, and so he is ready to die. First, he is sure of what waits for him beyond death. Look at verse 18 and following. Here's how it starts, second half of 18. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, I am sure that this, did you catch that this in verse 19? Through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, this, what is this? This imprisonment. This thing we talked about last week, these trials and troubles, these sufferings and setbacks, this imprisonment will turn out for my deliverance. Did you catch what he said? Yes, I will rejoice because I am sure that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, what does he mean by deliverance? Either he means deliverance as in by your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be set free. I'm going to be released from this prison and I will be delivered. And there's a chance that's true because at the end of this section, Paul's actually going to say, I am pretty sure I'm going to be able to come back to you for your progress in the faith and your joy in the Lord. And so there's this anticipation, perhaps, that he will be released. But in the very next verse, in verse 20, he just left open the possibility that he wants to glorify Jesus, whether that be through door one or door two, whether that be through life or death. You see, Paul really has the possibility of execution hanging over him. And so then, if he means by death, how can he say, I am sure that this will turn out for my deliverance? As in, I'm sure that even if they put me to death, it will turn out for my deliverance. How could that be? You see, this word deliverance here is actually in the original language, the word salvation. It's translated here, deliverance, in lots of other places, it's salvation. And what Paul is saying then is, I am sure by your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit that this is ultimately going to lead to my salvation. I'm sure that what awaits me is salvation. You think of that. What Paul is positive of is that even if he should die, it will ultimately turn out for his salvation. See, that's Paul's great hope. And Paul has a hope that cannot be touched, whether he be set free or put to death. Either one will lead for him to salvation. You think of this for Paul. Paul's saying it this way. So listen, if they let me out, then what that means is that if Paul gets out and he gets to live his life for Jesus, say Paul gets to live to a ripe old age. And there, after he's lived as long as he wants, sees his spiritual children and grandchildren, Now at an old age, surrounded on a bed by his family and friends, singing and praying, Paul peacefully drifts into sleep and goes to be with the Lord. Paul says, at the end of all that, I get salvation. Now on the other hand, if things end for me much more abruptly, as in I don't get set out, I get put on trial, and there in courage, I have to stand for Jesus Christ, and there they cut my very head off. No peaceful goodbye, no family, no friends, no deathbed, no singing, no prayers. They chop my head off, which, by the way, is what eventually happens to Paul. Well, then at the end of that, I get salvation. You see, either way, I am sure of this. This will turn out for my salvation. Door number one or door number two, it matters to me not because I am going to get on the other side of this salvation. You hear that, brothers and sisters? That's what he knows is waiting for him on the other side of death. Salvation in the Bible is this word that's talked about in three tenses, as in past and present and future. The Bible can say in one breath, we were saved and we are being saved and we will be saved. And the Bible can say that because when we trusted in Jesus, we were saved from the penalty of sin. And as the Holy Spirit lives in us, we are being saved from the power of sin. But one day we will go to glory and we will be saved even from the presence of sin. And salvation is this full work by which the penalty and power and presence of sin is totally destroyed and defeated. And Paul says, either way, that's coming for me. I will be saved. And I am sure that this will turn out for my salvation. 
Here, Paul has this hope that Rome can't touch, that death can't take, that the circumstances of life can't change. He knows that what is waiting for him is salvation. Oh, friend, would you think of that? I heard this sermon that referenced a eulogy by a a son to his mom, a mom named Lois Evans. If you know that name, you know that there's a, a preacher named Tony Evans, a great, wonderful preacher. And just about a little over a year ago or so, his wife suddenly passed away from cancer. And this man and wife, his ministry is very large and known around the world. And when Lois Evans came down with cancer, everybody was praying, praying for her deliverance, praying for her to be saved from this horrible cancer. And at the funeral, the son begins to speak in this eulogy and begins to process what this was like. And in that funeral, he says, I have to tell you, I really struggled with God in prayer. He began to say, you know, I said to the Lord, don't you see that we were all praying? And not just we as in our church, but around the country and around the world, we're all praying. And God, if you had just heard that prayer, you would have been the one who got glory from it. Everyone would have known. We would have given you the credit as having heard our prayer, and she could have gone on living and glorified you. Why didn't you answer? Why didn't you hear our prayer? In fact, you say things like, if we pray in accordance to your will, you'll hear us and answer. Why didn't you do that in response to our prayers? And then at that funeral, this son said he felt like God answered him. And here's what he said. Let me read you this quote from his eulogy at that funeral. He felt like God said to him, just because I didn't answer your prayer your way doesn't mean that I haven't already answered your prayer anyway. And then he says, There was only always two answers to your prayers. Either she was going to be healed or she was going to be healed. You see, either she was going to live or she was going to live. Either she was going to be with family or she was going to be with family. Either she was going to be well taken care of or she was going to be well taken care of. You don't understand because victory belongs to me already because of what I have done for you. Do you hear what Paul's saying? Paul is saying, I am sure of this, that this is going to turn out for my deliverance or for my deliverance, that this is going to turn out to my salvation or to my salvation. Can you see why Paul was unfazed and unafraid but had this strange confidence in the face of death? He knew what was waiting for him. He knew what was on the other side of door number one. But it wasn't just what was waiting for him. Paul also knew who was waiting for him on the other side of death. That's why Paul says, as he famously does in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And 23, my desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is better, far better. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better. Here's what he's saying. I know not only what awaits me, but who awaits me through the door of death. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Friend, especially if you are someone who knows and trusts in Jesus Christ, would you receive and hear this word as a comfort to your soul? While there are so many unknowns about death that make it scary, And rightly so, while it makes it frightening to us. So many things about it we don't know. And especially when it moves beyond something theoretical to something real. I was reading an article by Tim Keller. We've mentioned that name many times here. Tim Keller is a very well-known and helpful preacher. This past year, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He found that out while he was in the middle of writing a book on the resurrection. And as he's processing this, he wrote an article for The Atlantic. He said, you know, I realized... What I had been ascribing, subscribing as a medicine, prescribing for 34 years, now I had to realize, will I take my own medicine? All these things that I've been saying to people as I've sat by countless deathbeds, now it was my turn to apply these things. See, death is a horrible, frightening thing, and, and it stays abstract until it becomes real. But while there are so many things unknown about it, so many things that threaten to frighten and overwhelm us, Here's one thing Paul is saying you can know, which is that when you close your eyes in death to this world, you will arrive at Christ. 
and Christ is the destination by which your departure leads. My desire is to depart. Literally, the word there is like a boat that's being loosened from the dock and set free. And he's saying, when the ropes that hold me to this life are let go, I will arrive at the port of Christ. I will arrive in the bosom of Christ, at the destination of Christ. I will be with Christ. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. The great comfort for every believer is when you close your eyes to this world, truly you will open them to Christ. Truly you will see Christ. And the anticipation of that floods Paul's heart in such a way that he can say, yes, and I will rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice because when these eyes open, they will see Christ. And friend, if you are a Christian, would you let your Holy Spirit-driven imagination cause your mind to imagine what will it be like when that happens to you? What will it be like when the one that you read about in the Scriptures and trusted and followed and sought and served and loved and worshipped, you'll finally see him, you'll finally be with him, The one that you fought temptation for, no matter how hard this life was, you clung to him, you forsook so many worldly comforts because of your faith in him, you'll finally see him. The one who was promised in the scriptures to love you and gave himself for you, forgave all your sins, cleansed your filth, forgave your shame, gave you honor, you will see him and you will be with him. And when you consider that, when your mind is flooded with that, you will say with Paul, yes, and I rejoice. Because my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better by far. The anticipation is why we sing the kinds of songs we do. We sing things like Rock of Ages. And what do we sing? When mine eye shall close in death, while I draw this fleeting breath, when I soar to worlds unknown and see you there on your judgment throne, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. It's why we sing songs like soon, soon I will be with the one I love. With unveiled face I'll see him. And there my soul will be satisfied soon and very soon. And I want to believe that the Apostle Paul was singing that from his prison cell. Don't you know soon and very soon I will be with this one that I love and the one that who has loved with me, and to be with Christ is better by far. In fact, would you hear that also? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, would you hear, maybe you don't feel it right now, but would you receive this by faith? Even if you don't feel it, even if all your being doesn't know it, would you receive by faith? The Bible is promising you that what waits for you in death is better than this life. And you probably have to just seal that away and tuck it in your heart and know it and tattoo it onto your soul. What awaits me is better by far. Amidst all the splendid joys of this earth, and this earth is filled with splendid joys, of places to go and things to see and things to eat and people to love, amidst the promises of family and friendships, amidst all that this world has to offer, the testimony of the Bible is what is waiting for you is better by far. So when doubt begins to creep in and anxiety begins to paralyze, you tell your own soul in the face of death, what it is waiting for me is better by far. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better. Now, we should note together that it's not that Christians or Paul is somehow a fan of death. This isn't a passage to celebrate death to romanticize death, to sentimentalize death, to make death somehow seem pretty. Paul is not the kind of guy who would show up to a funeral and tell a grieving loved one, oh, you have nothing to cry about, this person's in a better place. Paul is not someone who would come and say, don't, don't you have any reason to cry? You don't have, don't you know to die is better and to be with Christ is better by far? Paul's not that guy. In fact, in the very next chapter, in chapter 2, Paul starts writing about his good friend, Epaphroditus, and he says, Epaphroditus got ill, and God had so much mercy on him, on me, that he didn't let him die, because if he did, it would have been sorrow upon sorrow for me. Did you catch that? You almost want to go, wait, Paul, how could you have your friend die and be sorrow upon sorrow when you're the one who said that to depart and be with Christ is better by far? 
Paul simply knows, look, we can all walk and chew gum at the same time. Both these things can be true at exactly the same time. The Bible is not simple about this, but, but mature in its understanding of death. That death can be at the same time, we, we're not, because of our theology, numb to its pain or to its loss or to its sorrow or to its grief. But with eyes that are full of tears, we can still hold on to what Paul is saying here. This is the paradox in the Bible, that death is this horrible enemy that we hate and evil that is horrific in every way. It is horrifying. It is cruel. It is uh, to be hated with all your might. But at the same time, by his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ has defeated death. And we hold that to be true as well. So that as one Christian said, death has now been transformed from this awful executioner to a gardener at best. So that after death does its worst to a believer, after it pulls out its ace card and its trump and plays it, at worst it has planted me into the ground from which I will spring up into the life that is truly life. Death can do its worst and yet still be defeated because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Paul is able to say, while death is horrible, while it is cruel and frightening, because we know what waits for us and who waits for us through the door of death, Paul can say, I am ready to die. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better by far. But as you keep reading the passage, you learn something, which is that while departing and being with Jesus would be better for Paul, staying and living for Jesus would be better for the Philippians. Hear that again. While departing and being with Jesus would be better for Paul, staying and living for Jesus would be better for the Philippians. And so Paul says, because I'm convinced of that, I'm pretty sure God's going to keep me around. Because while departing is better for me, staying is better for you. And so because of that, the other thing that you see is while he's ready to die, Paul has great reasons to live. While he's ready to die, while God gives him life and breath, he has great reason to live. Look at verse 21. It says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 22. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Verse 24. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with, continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming again to you. You hear what he says? While I am ready to die, he has great reason to live. He says, for me to live is Christ. I read this week that in the original language, there's actually no verb there. There's no is. Quite literally translated, it's for me to live Christ. For me to live Christ. Life, Christ. That's how Paul speaks of it. Life, Christ. I'm reminded of those early 90s t-shirts. I used to have one. It said like, basketball is life. The rest is just details. Do you remember those? Paul's got that t-shirt. And Paul's got a t-shirt that says, Christ is life, and the rest is just details. And here's the thing that that t-shirt did and Paul did that we often don't take the time to do. Paul has actually defined what life is and what life is about. Paul's actually taken the time to say, here's my definition of life. Here's the reason for my existence. I know why I'm on this earth. I know the purpose of why I'm here. I know why I'm alive. He's defined life so that he has a clear answer to what is life and why are you alive and why are you on this earth? I wonder if you have taken the time to answer that question. What is your life about? Because here's the thing. Whether you acknowledge it or not, you've got a t-shirt on also. You've got a life is blank. Whether you recognize it or not, you too have a life is blank, something that makes life worth living, something that if you didn't have would make your life not worth living. And so what is it for you that goes in the blank? And you can trot out all the usual suspects. Life is family. Life is my children. Life is my friendships. Life is romance. Life is Career, life is success, life is fame. 
But here's what Paul would say. At the end of the day, when you trot out all the blanks, what happens when your blank goes into the casket? What happens when your loved ones, who you built your life on and for, are buried into the ground because they will or you will be? Surely and truly, they cannot bear the weight of all your longings. What happens when the romance dies or the relationship falls apart? What happens when the career and success you lived your whole life for doesn't bring you the satisfaction you sought and all your expectations are in a casket? What happens when those things die? And Paul is saying, I had an answer to that blank that death couldn't take and the circumstances of life couldn't touch. Because for me to live Christ, for me to live Christ, and you could put me in a casket and it's game. You see, door one or door two, my life is defined by Christ. Christ is the answer to that. That's the t-shirt I'm wearing. Everything about my life is seen through the prism of Christ. And for Paul, all other things now could be taken away. Paul loved his friends, but he couldn't see his friends in jail in Rome. Paul loved his career. But his ministry career was over. There were no more cities to go to, no more sermons to preach, no more churches to plant. Because for Paul, life wasn't even ministry. It's not life is ministry. My life is Christ. For me to live is not ministry. For me to live is Christ. And so come what may, you could take it all, you could put them in the casket. Paul could say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He had a definition for life that couldn't be taken by death or touched by life. And so, Paul says, because of that, because life is defined by Christ, here's how Paul thinks this life will go. He says, which means that if I am to live 22, it'll be fruitful labor. And that fruitful labor will mean, in verse 25, he says, for your progress and joy in the faith. I find this, I don't know about you friends, so wonderfully clarified. It means there are two categories of existence. There is life and there is death and Christ dominates both. There's simply two categories of existence. There's life and if I'm going to live, it's for Christ, for fruitful labor, to the end of seeing people make progress in their faith and have joy in Jesus. It's so clarifying. Why are you alive? Why is their breath still in your lungs? Why is your heart still beating? You have one reason. It's for Christ, fruitful labor, to see people progress and have joy in Christ. That's why I'm alive. Because to depart would be better by far. But if the Lord Jesus has me here, it's because of this one purpose, to see people find joy and make progress in their faith, to have fruitful labor, to live for Christ. The other category, if I'm not that, it's death, which means I depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So in death, I gain Christ. In life, I live for Christ. Either way, Christ dominates both categories. Isn't it so clarifying? If God keeps you alive, you know why. And if God takes you home, you know why. Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. So friends, this passage has two questions for us and two questions for you. Do you have a reason to live? And are you ready to die? That's the question of this passage. Do you, friend, have a reason to live? And are you, friend, ready to die? Do you have a reason to live? As in you've got a definition for life, a bottom line. Life is blank. And Paul simply wants to put forward for you Oh, friend, fill that blank in with Christ. And in fact, do so because Jesus is the only one of those blanks who would say back to you, I put you in my blank. You see, Jesus would say to us, for you, I counted death gain. In fact, for me to come and live and die was for you. And to die for you was gain for me. No other blank will say that to your soul. In fact, while you were wearing a different kind of t-shirt, he came and said, for me to die for you would be gain for me because to have you is gain. And here's what conversion means. Conversion literally means you take off your one t-shirt 
and you put on Paul's today. And you say, no one else can I put in that blank but Jesus Christ. And the invitation of this passage is, here's your reason to live. The underlying, bottom line foundation of your life for you to live is Christ. And friend, are you ready to die? Even the feeblest of us, the most weak of us, not heroic, giant Christians, just average, ordinary Christians like us, by the prayers of God's people and the help of the Holy Spirit, we too can make it to the end and die in Christ. I can tell you, ordinary people like us, not just the giants, ordinary people like us, if we define our life as about Christ, we can also die in Christ. I've seen two people die in my life. One is I was at Freddie and Daniel and Dennis's father's deathbed. I was invited to be there and got to see that. And the other is I was at my father-in-law's deathbed. And I watched these two men die. I saw Fred's dad say in that last hour while lying on that deathbed, he said over and over again, Jesus is at the door, fight for him. And I heard this man say over and over again, fight for him, like he was telling all the living, live for Christ. If you have life left, live it for Christ. For you to live is Christ. And then I watched my father-in-law. I held my four-year-old son in my hand, and I watched this man lying on a bed from which he would never get up again. And on that bed, five times he said, use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. It almost sounds like what Paul said in verse 20, right? For me, whether in my body, by life or by death, I want to honor Jesus. And this man pleaded that the Lord God would use him even on that deathbed. And then after five times, I heard him say, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he drifted off into sleep. And his eyes opened to see Jesus. You see, they had decided that their life was Christ. And because of that, they saw death as gain. And we can too. In 62 AD, the happiest man in Rome was sitting in a Roman prison cell. And he said, yes, and I will rejoice because I know what and who waits for me and for me to live is Christ and die is gain. Let's pray together. Our God, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you that it gives us life and it clarifies for us. We pray even now by the help of the Holy Spirit that you might cause all of us to make progress and find joy in Christ, that you might give us a reason to live and make us a people that are ready to die. We pray, O oh Lord, that if there be any here, even today, who does not know you, today would be the day where they take off one shirt and put on another, and they define life as being about Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us these truths, and that we would hold them now so that at the right time, these truths would in turn hold us. That's what we'll need, O oh Lord. When that hour comes, these things that we have held, these medicines we've prescribed, in that hour, we pray we would take them, believe them, and we would die in Christ. Hear our prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.